want to uh, say a few more things, point to a few more things in God's word today about uh, the third commandment, which we have on the board up there. You can see it in the middle. It's all about the Sabbath day. And, uh, of course, the Sabbath day uh, in the New Testament era, after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, is no longer the seventh day of the week. Uh, we looked at this Thursday, for example, where the Bible says that in the New Testament. Uh, but the importance of it is, it's every seventh day that God commanded us in the third commandment to set aside at least every seventh day, whatever in our freedom that we want to make that, whether it's Sunday or Wednesday or whatever, that uh, he's saying to us, as I created the world, uh, the universe in six days and then rested the seventh day, so I want you to work six days and the seventh day is your day of rest for me, that you make it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy means dedicated to God, that you have at least one day a week set aside for God, not earthly endeavors. Uh, that's not asking too much, I don't think. One out of seven, one-seventh. But it's obviously too much for most people. doesn't matter what day it is. Now, the New Testament Christians, they chose Sunday morning, and we see this in the New Testament, in the book of Acts and in the epistles. And that continued as a tradition down to our day, that the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the first day of the week, early in the morning, uh, that was thought to be a thing to remember every week on Sunday morning. So we commemorate the resurrection of Christ by meeting every Sunday morning. And so that basically gets down to the third commandment. That's how we obey it. That's how we disobey it. Uh, with that background, uh, I'd like to look at a few Bible verses here. Uh, this is one that we discussed Thursday at our Bible class, but let's go back and start with it today in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 verse 25. That's where we're going to start today. And before we get to verse 25, I'd like to just look at the context, because the context is always important, too, to a verse. But in verse 23, the, the, the sentence begins there. Let us, meaning the Christ believers, the children of God, the heirs of heaven, let us hold fast, in other words, don't let go of it, cling to it like your life depended on it. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith, not just hold fast the faith, but hold the profession of the faith. That you profess it before other people. You don't just keep it to yourself. We profess it to, to other people. The profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful, that promise. Now that means God's promises are, he's faithful to them. He cannot lie. They will certainly come to pass. Uh, for example, he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. That's a promise of God. And uh, he, can, he can't do otherwise. Uh, so he's faithful to all those promises that we have our faith in and we trust. And let us consider one another. Now, what does that mean? What is one another? Uh, okay, but again, the context is the believers. The us in verse 22, I mean, uh, you know, in, in 23. Uh, the our in verse 23, those are the, the Christians. 
the believers in the Bible, the believe, ones who believe God. Uh, and let us consider one another means our fellow believers. There, there's to be a, a, a bond, a relationship, a very a sacred relationship between believers. We don't look upon believers as we look upon unbelievers. Just as, as God doesn't look upon believers and unbelievers the same. There's a great difference. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then he goes on to say, he that believeth not shall be damned. I mean, that's a pretty big difference that God sees in people. Uh, so we, we also see this difference. Not that we hate unbelievers, of course not. We're commanded to love our neighbor. But, but our fellow believers are our brothers and sisters, not our neighbor alone. Uh, we're in the same family. We have the same father, God. Unbelievers don't have God as their father. The Bible makes that clear. Their father is the devil. So we're not their brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus passed his hand over a crowd of people he was uh, teaching in his house or in a house one day, and he said, these are my brothers and sisters and mother. Even though his physical mother and brothers and sisters were outside the house wanting him to come out and talk to them. It's a special bond between believers. And uh, we shouldn't ignore that, as it says here. Let us consider one another. Let us consider our fellow believers. Not, not disregard them, not, not uh, ignore them, but seek them out to have fellowship with them. As we read in Acts 2, right after Pentecost, in Acts 2, where it says 3,000 or over 3,000 people came to faith that day. This great outpouring of the Holy Ghost went from uh, looking for the Messiah to believing that Jesus was the Messiah and he had come and put their faith in him and were baptized, it says that day. Uh, And then it says in the next verse, and they continued in fellowship. They didn't just wander home and say, I don't care about those other people that were brought to faith today in Jesus. They continued together. Uh, That's a great blessing to have fellow believers. And so let us consider one another, think about one another, and thank God for one another to provoke unto love and to good works to encourage one another. We need each other. Uh, In the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah got really down and depressed and discouraged, didn't he? Why? Yeah, he's. I'm the only believer left on earth. They've all forsaken God. They've all gone to false gods. He was really down. How down was he? He wanted to kill himself all things. But he didn't. Because God answered his prayer and said what? Yeah, there's 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed their knees to Baal. He, He assured Elijah. You've got fellow believers, Elijah. That's what comforted him. This considering one another and provoking one another unto love and to good works. What a blessing it is to have a church that believes and teaches the Bible and has members who believe it. So that's what it's talking about here. And then it really hits a nail on the head in verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Assembling together. Not just knowing we have fellow believers, but assembling together with those believers. Physically coming together. That is so important to our faith, to our eternal life. And this is the third commandment. This is how we keep it. The Sabbath day, 
We gather together. We don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Our flesh doesn't want to do it. Yeah, flesh wants to stay home, stay in bed, golf, do chores around the house, whatever. But our spirit, our soul, needs this. This gathering together. Don't forsake it, it says here. As the manner of some is, unfortunately. But exhorting one another, speaking to one another, building one another up in the faith, so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day? Judgment Judgment day, the last day of this world. Jesus returns visibly. Now as it approaches, it's even more important to do this, not less important. So this is how you keep the third commandment. It's how you keep it. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Was this well, Elijah then killed himself. That would have done all the other believers harm. If you ever see this great, what's this proved to be a great prophet, mm-hmm. you know, ended his own life, that would have been harmful to their faith. Sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Like what's left if this great prophet mm-hmm. ended his own life. That's exactly right. God would not have that. So he gave Elijah that special revelation. Let's go to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Now Ecclesiastes is one of those verses you probably, or books you don't look at too often, but it's a, it's a great book of the Bible, inspired by God, a book of wisdom. 5, Ecclesiastes 5. It's after Proverbs. Towards the center of the Bible, a little bit past the center, past Psalms and Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. We all have that? What does it state? What is the first few words? Keep thy foot. Yeah, keep thy foot. In other words, uh, be mindful of where you're at and where you're going. When thou goest where? To the house of God. To the house of God. Yeah, Where's, what's the house of God? It's the church. It's other believers gathering together. You go to the house of God. You you pick up your feet and you walk. Okay? That's why God gave you feet. Uh, So you you be mindful of this. Why you're going there, when you're to go there, that you go to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. What does that mean to go to church even if you go to give the sacrifice of fools? Sacrifice is what you do for God. It's anything you do for God. That's a sacrifice. Uh, what's the sacrifice of fools, do you think? Well, uh, perhaps. It, the, well, there, that would be hypocrisy. But they do have a habit, right? It's they, they aren't really, uh, if they don't look at their sin as a sin, uh, they do it out of habit. Uh, they, they just lack true repentance. Yeah, a fool. What's a fool? A fool doesn't think. He doesn't think. There's nothing going on in his brain. He just does it like Daryl says out of habit. I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm just... I'm just doing it because I'm, I'm supposed to do it or something. That's, so a sacrifice of fools is people who go to church, but they do it thoughtlessly. Like, well, I just do it because my friends are there. I want to see my friends, and uh, I don't know. I'm kind of in the habit of doing it, and it makes me feel good. And that, that's the sacrifice of fools. Keep thy feet when you go to the house of God. Don't just go, and then your thoughts are on everything else but God. You go to God's house to worship God and to hear God speak to you. That's that's why you go there, but you also go there for each other, to build one another up and to provoke one another to good works and to love. 
Uh, so, there you have Ecclesiastes 5.1. Let's look at some more verses. Uh, let's go to uh, John 8 in the New Testament. This, you know, Jesus uh, speaks very clearly, succinctly, doesn't waste words. And uh, we have in John 8, 47, words of Jesus. Now, we, we go to God's house every seventh day at least to... Build one another up, gather together. Uh, we don't forsake the gathering together of the brethren. But we also go to hear God speak to us collectively through the preaching and the teaching of God's word, the Bible. Uh, what does Jesus say to us in uh, verse 47 here? What's the first word? He. Everybody have that? He. He. 847. 847. Jesus says, He that is of God, in other words, a child of God, related to God, uh, in good with God, he that is of God, does what? Yeah. That's just one of the marks, the indelible marks of a Christ believer. If you belong to God, if you're his child, you hear his word. And then he goes on to clarify this, so there's no mistake about it. Ye therefore uh, hear them not, because you're not of God. If somebody doesn't want to hear the word of God, what does it say? They're not of God. They're not godly. They're not children of God. They're not related to God. They're not in God's family. This is a sign that you're a Christ believer. You want to hear the Bible. You want to hear your father speak to you. And at least every seven days, Sabbath day. So how do you sin against the third commandment? What does breaking the third commandment mean then? Yeah, it's either not going at all, or you go seldom, or, you know, every now and then. And then when you do go, you go carelessly, without thought, like a fool. You're thinking about what you're going to do that afternoon. You're worried about what, what's coming up the next week. You're not going with your mind on God and his word and your fellow Christians. That's right. And so yeah. I try to make sure I think about what I'm saying mm -hmm. and not just do it without thought. That's exactly, exactly right. That's, that's praying like a fool. I'm mouthing words while my heart isn't there. Right. Same thing with the Lord's Prayer. We've memorized it. We say it in church all the time. It's easy to get into the habit of just saying the words while you're thinking about something else because you've memorized it. And when you go to God's house and you hear the preaching and the teaching, if it is truly based on the Bible and not coming out of that preacher's own head, his own personal opinions or reflecting the world's thoughts, if it's truly the word of God that he's preaching and explaining, then what are you hearing? You're hearing some man? You're hearing God, yeah. Go to Luke 10. Luke 10. Luke 10. Now, 
you read the first verse of Luke 10, there's your context. Luke 10, verse 1. Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, okay? After these things, the Lord, meaning Jesus Christ, appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Okay? So he's, he's appointing 70 of his disciples. They have included the 12 apostles. We don't know. But he's got 70 disciples, followers of his, and he sends them two by two all over Galilee to various towns to, uh, to preach his word that he, of course, had been preaching to them. Before he died on the cross, he was a teacher, uh, a prophet, bringing God's word. And uh, so now he sends these others out to be his mouthpieces and to speak his word. And then at the end of this, uh, telling them, giving them instruction, what's the last thing he says to them in verse 16? He that heareth you, heareth who? Me. Yeah. You're just my mouthpiece. You're just my messenger. It's not your message. It's my message. You're taking my message that I myself have taught and would teach them. So when they hear you, they should think what? Yeah, this is, this is the same as Jesus being here. Because they're speaking what Jesus said. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that he- despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me, the Father, God the Father. So if you don't hear the Bible being preached and taught in its truth and purity, you don't go to church, you don't listen to the preacher, the pastor, you're really despising Who? The preacher? You're despising God. If he's speaking the, uh, the word of God, you're saying, I don't want to hear God. And that's why the third commandment. First three commandments deal with our duty to God. Commanded to hear him. Uh, and the same could be said of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, other forms of the Word of God. I don't want to go to the Lord's Supper. It's not important to me. I don't want to go to the Lord's Supper. That's despising God. I don't care if I receive the body and blood of my Savior. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I can take it or leave it. I don't care if I'm baptized or not. That's despising God. His command. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, the same vein in First Thessalonians in the New Testament. First Thessalonians. It's back where all those T's are in the Bible. You know, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. All lined up together there. First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians two, verse thirteen. First Thessalonians two thirteen. Everybody have that? How does it begin? Good. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye, and he's writing here to the Christians in Thessalonica, Greece, he's talking about when he was there first and established the Christian church there, the congregation that he's now writing to. He's thanking God for them, that they came to faith, that they believed the word of God, believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I thank God for you, 
Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's what brought you to faith. It had the power to change you, change your beliefs, change your life, change your whole outlook and philosophy of life. That's the power of God working through his word. But it was preached by mere men, by, by Paul and his assistants that traveled around. And he thanks God for them that they received that word of God, not as his word, not as the word of a man. It was the word of God, that God himself was visiting them and speaking to them. That's another way you keep the third commandment. You don't just go to church. But you listen, and you, you listen to the Bible as God himself speaking to you directly, even if it be through a pastor or some other teacher. If he's truly knowledgeable of the Bible and is sticking strictly to the Bible, you hear what he says as if God himself were saying it. That's how you keep the third commandment. How else does God speak to us if it's not through the Bible? (laughs) And I'm getting to this because that's the theme of our worship service today on Pentecost. How do we get the Bible? Where does it come from? The Holy Spirit inspired the Bible says. It's not the word of man, the word of the people who wrote it, uh, but God used them as his tools. He inspired them. The Holy Ghost inspired them to write these words. So it's not the word of man, it's the word of God. And it was the work of the Holy Ghost that we have this book. And it's the only place God speaks to us. We can't trust that God speaks to us through dreams or visions. We're not apostles or prophets in that regard. We're not inspired to write the word of God for all people for all time. But the prophets and apostles were. And so we receive this book. This is the one thing that we can trust that God wrote. And it's not deceiving us and lying to us. That's why it's so important. Here's the one place that God comes to us and gives us this knowledge of himself and of ourselves. So we receive it that way. Okay, with that introduction, let's go to the book of Mark and pick up where we were then. And again, I ask you to help me look at the time when 10 o'clock rolls around because I don't have a watch. 9.39, thank you. Okay, so in Mark chapter 2, we'll pick it up there. I'm not going to go back and, and rehash the first few verses. You know what's going on. We've been here many times. I want to pick it up in verse 8. Mark 2, verse 8. You all there? Okay, it says, And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Uh, And the key word is within themselves. First of all, who is themselves? Very good, Terry, yes, the the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious Jewish leaders of the church of that day. That's the themselves. Uh, And they they were rejecting Jesus here. They weren't listening to him as they should. You you hear the word of God. But they were rejecting him. And uh, Jesus knew this because it says, that they so reasoned this within themselves. In other words, were they saying these things outwardly? 
They were just thinking them. And Jesus could do what? Yeah, he knew what they were thinking. It says here, Jesus immediately perceived what they were reasoning within themselves. Just as he does with all of us. He knows all of our thoughts. Not just our words and deeds. He knows our thoughts immediately. The minute we think them, he knows them. Uh, This is a proof that he's God, right? Because only God is omniscient. Only God knows all things. Of course not. They, They were rejecting him. They were trying to get something to accuse him of legally. I want to I want to dwell on this thought for a moment that Jesus is God who perceives our thoughts, knows our thoughts immediately. Let's go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter one. Now, this is early in Jesus's public life and. He is calling the apostles, gathering the apostles, the twelve, the witnesses. And uh, he, um, John 1, John chapter 1. And uh, let's pick it up at verse 43, the beginning of the paragraph, just for the context here. Okay? John 1, 43. The day following, okay, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. He's calling him to be an apostle. 44. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, up there on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's a Galilean. Okay. And what is the first thing that Philip does? In verse 45, he goes and finds his brother, Nathanael. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What's he saying he now believes about Jesus? He is the Messiah. He is the promised one of the Old Testament that God would come and save us from our sins in eternal hell. We found him, and he's coming out of Galilee. In fact, he's coming from Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph the carpenter. That's the Messiah. Okay, he's he's the promised Savior of the world. We found him, Nathaniel. We found him. What's Nathaniel's response in verse 46 to this? And Nathanael said unto him, unto Philip, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? (laughs) So he's saying, I don't believe it. Why not? Because Nazareth, from an earlier uh, perspective, is, uh, I don't know, a second class citizen. (laughs) Yeah, right. It's, It's far from where you'd expect the Messiah to come out of. To grow up, up in. One of the greatest yeah, it was a very small little town up in Galilee, which is kind of the renegade Jewish area, second class Jews. and Yeah, you would expect the Messiah to come from where? Jerusalem, the, the, the capital of the people of God, where the temple is and the scribes and the Pharisees and the high priests. That's where you expect the Messiah to come from and not some little know-nothing town up in Galilee. So he's refusing to believe because of outward appearances. What does Philip respond? Philip saith unto him, come and see. So he's a long way away. Philip had to travel who knows how far to find Nathanael and then bring him back to where Jesus was. So he just says, well, just come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, what? Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. As if he knows him already. 
He already knows this Nathaniel, who he's never met in human terms. But he already knows he's a man of no guile. He, he's not a, uh, a liar. He's, not a, he's a straight shooter. You know. He's not a trickster, a huckster. Verse 48, Nathanael saith unto him, to Jesus, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? <laughs> I never met you before. You never met me. How do you know me? How do you know I'm a man with no guile? Jesus answered and said to him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. (laughs) How did Jesus know that when Philip got to Nathanael, he was under a fig tree? Because he's God, yeah. He knows where everybody is all the time. He knows what their thoughts are all the time. Okay? Did this convince Nathanael? Yeah, look at the next verse. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. That alone was enough to convince Nathanael that uh, Philip was right. You're God. You're the Savior. You know all about me. Even though I couldn't see you, you could see me no matter where I was. You know all about me. Just like Jesus here in Mark 2, he he knows what these guys are thinking. Even though they're not saying it out loud, he reads their thoughts. Let's go to chapter 2 of John. Here we have it again. Chapter 2. Verse 24. What does it say? Yeah, but Jesus. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he what? He knew all men. He didn't trust them. He knew who to be around. (laughs) Because he knows the hearts and the thoughts of all people. Verse 25, And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in God knows you perfectly. He knows you better than yourself. Jesus is that God. Let's go to chapter 6 of John. John 6, verse 64. John 6, 64. But there are some of you that believe not, Jesus said to this crowd of people. Some of you don't believe in me. Some of you believe not. Why? For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Why does Jesus know that? Because he's God. It's only only explanation. Angels don't know that. Only God knows that. He knows the believers from the unbelievers. He sees into their souls. You can fool people, but you can't fool God. Jesus is God. Go to chapter 13 in John. John 13, this is the so-called upper room, the Last Supper, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, You know that Judas is the betrayer. Now go down to verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to who? Judas Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. In other words, Jesus knew who was going to betray him. 
He knows everything. He knew it was in the heart of, of Judas. Go to chapter 21 of John. This is after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and uh, he's meeting with the apostles gathered on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he turns to Simon Peter and asks him three times what? Do you love me? Yeah. And he does this because of what? He wants to remind Peter that he knows and hasn't forgotten. Yeah, he denied Jesus, that he knew Jesus three times the night before Jesus was crucified. So he asked him three times, lovest thou me? And uh, the third time he asked him, uh, in verse 17, uh, let's read that. Everybody have that? He, Jesus, saith unto him, Peter, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he, Peter, said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. In other words, Peter knew that that Jesus could see his heart, see his thoughts, see his beliefs, see who he loved. Yeah, yeah. And and here to convince Jesus of his of his truthfulness, Peter says, You know all things. You know if I'm lying to you when I say I love you. You know I'm being true. Because you know everything. I can't hide it from you. So we have these these signposts throughout the Bible of Jesus' divinity, that he is God come down from heaven to save us. What time is it? I got seven minutes, okay. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, Mark 2 then, where Jesus reads the minds not only of the scribes and Pharisees and their uh, treachery, but he also previously had read the minds of who? Verse 5. Yeah, yeah. Paralyzed man and his friends. He knew that they were believers, just like he knows now that the uh, scribes and Pharisees were unbelievers. So in uh, in verse 8, uh, Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. Go back to verse 6. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. So again, this isn't being spoken. This is just their thinking. And Jesus reads their thinking. And he wasn't guessing what they were thinking. This is not a guess. He knew what they were thinking thinking. He knew it, without a doubt. Let's go back to Matthew for just a moment, the book of Matthew, chapter 9. Here we have the case of Jesus in a ship. Okay, Matthew 9, verse 1. You all have that? Matthew 9, 1. And he entered into a ship, Jesus, and passed over the Sea of Galilee, and came into his own city, Capernaum. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Sound familiar? This is the same event. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he didn't guess at their thoughts. He knew their thoughts without any doubt. 
He knew exactly what they were thinking. So again, this proves that Jesus is who? He, he has to be God. He has to be. That's right. Uh, we see this on the board under the first commandment. Uh, uh, shall have no other gods before me. The only God that knows all things. He's all-knowing, it says there. Or we call it omniscient. Uh, let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. To show this has to be God. Jesus has to be God. 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8. First Kings 8 in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter at this point who said these words. It happens to be King Solomon, but don't worry about that. This is the truth of the Bible. This is in the Bible. That's all you need to know. First Kings 8:39. 1 Kings 8, 39. How does it begin? Then hear. Yeah, then hear thou in heaven. Who's in heaven? Who's going to hear in heaven? God. God. Okay, he's talking about God. O thou, that's God. O thou in heaven, <coughs> thy dwelling place, <coughs> hear us. <coughs> hear thou in heaven. And forgive us. Forgive us what? Sin. Our sins. Yeah, our sins of thought, word, and deed. And forgive, don't punish us for our sins, forgive us. And do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. <coughs> Does anybody else know Any, your thoughts besides God? No. Not even, huh? Huh? Oh, okay, thank you. Only God. So therefore, if God knows their thoughts, that equals what? Jesus is, has to be. It says only God knows the hearts of men. Devil doesn't. Angels don't. Certainly no mind reader doesn't. <coughs> no human being. Shall we close with the benediction? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.